you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, who in thy wisdom and goodness has appointed the office of rulers and parliaments for the welfare of society and the just government of men, we beseech thee to behold with thy abundant favor us thy servants, whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of important trust in these islands. Let thy blessing descend upon us here assembled, and grant that we may treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote thy honor and glory, and to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of these islands, and of those whose interests thou hast committed to our charge. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Morning, members. Confirmation of minutes. Members, the minutes of February 22nd have been circulated. Are there any omissions, corrections? There are none. Minutes are confirmed as printed. Announcements by the speaker. There are two announcements this morning. First is that the, we have received word from Member Tyrrell that he'll be absent today. And the second is that the Joint Select Committee on the events of the 2nd of December 2016 have been given a three-month extension. S.C. Richards is absent today as well. And also, um, Member S.D. Richards has also indicated that he'll be absent as well today. Messages from the Senate. There are none. Papers and other communications to the House. There's one paper to be communicated this morning, and that's in the name of Minister of National Security. Minister. If it pleases you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, continue. Mr. Speaker, with the government's recommendation and in accordance with Section 36, Subsection 3 of the Bermuda Constitution, I have the honor to attach and submit for the consideration of this, this Honorable House of, of Assembly of Bermuda the Immigration and Protection Land Holding Charges Amendment Regulations 2019 proposed to be made by the Minister of National Security under the provision of Section 102C, Subsection 1A of the Bermuda Immigration and Protection Act 1956. Thank you, Minister. Petitions. There are none. Statements by ministers. There are six statements this morning. The first is in the name of the Premier. Premier, would you like to present your statement this morning? Uh, absolutely, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. I rise this morning to inform this Honorable House that a strategic plan for government reform has been finalized 
and implementation will now commence. Mr. Speaker, honorable members will recall that the former ministry for the cabinet office with responsibility for government reform partnered with PricewaterhouseCoopers Advisory Limited, PwC, to deliver a strategic plan that over time is expected to change the way that government delivers its services. PwC worked with public officers, ministers, and consulted union representatives have, to produce the plan. Mr. Speaker, the process of reform in the public service is an exceptionally complex endeavor. Successive governments have considered and actioned a series of reviews and studies by a number of external consultants and produced voluminous reports. Elements of some reports have been actioned and others have simply been set aside. Mr. Speaker, in accordance with this government's commitment to improve the efficiency of the public service, as laid out in its 2017 election platform, the government reviewed the SAGE report and evaluated its recommendations. Mr. Speaker, there was, however, a shortcoming with that report in that there was no unifying vision, no altruistic purpose, and no clear quantifiable objectives, all of which are key components of a public service reform plan. With this in mind, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to deliver a government reform strategic plan for the public service that includes our vision and purpose, which codify the overarching reform objectives for the public service. Mr. Speaker, part of realizing a vision is actually having one. And our reform vision is, and I quote, a future forward government for the people of Bermuda, end quote. Mr. Speaker, it is the government's intent to focus on the outcomes that society needs and wants while managing major economic, social, and technological changes. The main focus of the plan is a target operating model and an accompanying quick wins plan that lays out specific deliverables to be accomplished in the near term. The target operating model is comprised of five strategic areas. Process, clear administrative processes and policies and sound fiscal management. Platform, organizational structure, workforce and IT infrastructure designed for execution. People, committed, capable, well-trained resources receiving fair benefits for their work. Perspective, customer service mentality embracing growth and business <coughs> development. Performance, a culture of measuring activity and results enabling true accountability. Mr. Speaker, within the Quick Wins Plan, there is a significant people focus, consolidating the human capital function, implementing system-wide performance appraisal processes, building out our talent management pro talent management and leadership development programs, and deploying an employee wellness program. Our people and our systems are the cornerstone of the change process, but not in isolation. Simultaneously, we'll focus on upgrading the platform elements of the public service, that is modernizing the organizational structure and ensuring the workplace and IT infrastructure is designed for execution. Mr. Speaker, in the longer term, the government will focus on the development and implementation of an operating model that enables the execution of our strategy. To ensure success, it's important that there is a dedicated team of public officers focused on implementing the objectives which have been laid out in the strategic plan. On Monday, it was announced that the Deputy Head of the Public Service, Ms. Sherry Witter, will relinquish her responsibilities as Permanent Secretary for the Cabinet Office and will be dedicated full-time to public service reform implementation. As a part of the project mobilization process, we will commence the next phase of engagement with our union partners and key stakeholders. Work to embed a change management framework in the public service will be undertaken. The service will be clear on our strategic intent and the strategic objectives which will determine what needs to be done, what needs to be accomplished in order to achieve public sector reform. Mr. Speaker, the plan is both practical and aspirational. It builds on the reform work already undertaken or in progress, which strategically aligned with our vision and purpose. Mr. Speaker, following the next phase of consultation with our union partners, I look forward to tabling the plan in this honorable house. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Premier. The second statement on the order this morning is in the name of the Minister of Finance. Minister. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Mr. Speaker, I, I'm pleased to provide this honorable house and the listening public with an update on the work of the Bermuda Casino Gaming Commission and also provide an update on the government's intentions for transferring the regulating of Bermuda's betting industry to the commission. 
Mr. Speaker, questions continue to circle regarding the challenges faced by the Bermuda Casino Gaming Commission. I wish to inform the people of Bermuda that in my short tenure as the minister responsible for this organization, I would like to congratulate the tenacity and resilience of the team who continue to forge ahead in their efforts despite challenges faced due to the delay, delays in progressing gaming. Despite these challenges, there are fundamental priorities which the Commission are focusing on at this juncture, the first of which is securing a correspondent bank. Mr. Speaker, as a high priority, the Commission has engaged in discussions with three local banks, namely the Bank of N.T. Butterfield and Sun Limited, Clarion Bank, and the Bermuda Commercial Bank, to secure a local bank with a U.S. correspondent bank relationship that would accept the proceeds of the casino gaming operations. Further discussions will be carried out with the BMA as banking regulators and the U.S. correspondent banks. Mr. Speaker, another critical priority for the Commission is the recruitment of an executive director. I would like to address the priority and provide an update on actions taken by the Commission in filling the vacant post of executive director. It is widely known that the former executive director tendered his resignation and vacated the post in December 2017, and the Commission has subsequently undertaken an extensive recruitment process without an appointment to date. This post was advertised both locally and overseas as follows. August 2017, March 2018, October 2018, and January 2019. Mr. Speaker, it has been decided to engage the services of an executive recruiter to, ex to assist with securing a suitably qualified leader for the Commission's team as soon as possible. Whilst this critical post is still being sourced and a casino not yet open, the executives of the Commission have stepped up upon the recommendation of the Board to perform duties in an acting capacity to provide leadership, governance, and continued development of the regulatory framework in preparation for the next stage of regulation. Mr. Speaker, it is publicly known that the Commission has experienced a, re a reduction in resource due to resignations and one redundancy. I would like to use this opportunity to provide some context. The Commission is a regulator, and, an or and any organization in its embryonic stage is required to be responsive to ensure it has the correct balance of skills to achieve its aims and objectives. This can be, at times, a moving target. However, a small organization such as this may need to change the shape and method of delivery by using external vendors to provide some expertise to respond quicker to demands. Mr. Speaker, whilst the above-mentioned priorities are progressing, the Commission is proceeding with the suitability investigation stage of the casino licensing process. Mr. Speaker, I will attempt to summarize and provide this Honorable House the sample of that process. The first phase is the suitability investigation, it is a request for the applicant's corporate organizational chart. This should include the corporate structure, all ownership interests by percentage, <coughs> associates and names of owners, including that of all entities below the parent company, as well as names and titles of all officers and directors of the parent company and any subsidiary. The Commission will then review the documentation, and upon the outcome, it will determine whether any further information requests will be made. Associated entities and those that are involved in financing or managing the casino may also be required to submit information. Mr. Speaker, the Commission will conduct a further review and identify the individuals or entities who are required to file application <coughs> forms. Subsequent to the application being considered complete, the file is assigned to an inspector or third-party firm to begin an investigation phase. This phase will involve the use of public sources and other records, records checks uh, regarding issues such as bankruptcy or insolvency proceedings, litigation history, credit reports, criminal history checks, name and company searches. In addition, a, a field investigation of a corporate entity will be undertaken. This requires the comprehensive review of all documents and information and can include items such as meeting minutes, financial reports, corporate finances, policies and procedures such as AML, regulatory filings, and corporate litigation. Mr. Speaker, the results of the investigation will be assessed to determine any issues that could negatively affect suitability and identify whether additional interviews are deemed necessary. Mr. Speaker, it is the intent of government to transfer the regulatory responsibility of betting shops from the Betting Licensing Authority to the Commission. In order to ensure this sector is regulated thoroughly and to a level or standard equivalent to mature regu regulatory jurisdictions, the current legislative framework will need to be revised. The Commission is poised to complete 
legislative framework, including AML, ATF controls for licensing and supervision of betting and other non-casino gaming activities in 2019. At present, the betting operators are licensed by the Betting Licensing Authority pursuant to the Betting Act 1975. Consultation with the betting operators regarding the legislative changes and the pending compliance requirements is ongoing. This consultation has involved educating them on the introduction of a new AML ATF regime and the subsequent impact this may have on resources and their operations. The Commission will assist them in undertaking understanding the importance of adopting policies that create robust internal controls that will, will meet the new legislative requirements. Mr. Speaker, the Commission is also drafting a licensing conditions and code of practice document, which will be introduced in tandem with the legislation governing the betting sector. Mr. Speaker, the casino gaming regulations, which have been drafted, cover a wide range of topics which will govern the oversight of the regulatory process for gaming operations. A dedicated draftman, draftsman from the Attorney General's Chambers has worked alongside the Commission's former General Counsel to create regulations which will assist casino operators to comply with the supervisory regime. This Honorable House and members of the listening public should also be advised that the Commission has consulted with established gaming jurisdictions, well-known and respected testing laboratories, and experts to assist in the development of these regulations. Mr. Speaker, in keeping with this vision, to be recognized as a progressive, innovative, and socially responsible regulatory body, the Bermuda Casino Gaming Commission continues to develop and implement a comprehensive problem and responsibility gaming program. The Commission has, ha has been a member of the National Council of Problem Gaming since 2017. The Commission, through its Problem and Responsible Gaming Council, aims to educate, equip, and empower the people of Bermuda to make healthy choices regarding gaming and to train support services in caring for individuals and families who may be experiencing challenges associated with gaming. Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to advise members of the public that the month of March has been designated as the casino, as the, by the Commission as Problem Gaming Awareness Month. The Commission is viewed as a beacon by the NCPG to, to its members for prioritizing its problem and responsible gaming program. To date, the following have been accomplished. 62 counselors have received over 40 hours of clinical training in treating problem, gamer, problem gamblers. Our next training is scheduled for April 26th and 27th. The Commission has facilitated an agreement between Bermuda Addiction Certification Board and the International Gambling Counselors Certification Board for local counselors to be internationally certified and registered with the Bermuda Allied Health Council under the BACB. It is it is planned to have counselors ready to sit the certification exam in October of this year. To date, the Commission has provided over 30 hours of clinical training to more than 30 faith-based ministers, pastors, and lay leaders. Training, trainings have focused on equipping them to triage individuals and families who seek their support to address problem gaming issues. The Commission has given presentations to all counselors employed by the Department of Education some of the private school counselors and PTAs. Additional presentations are, and workshops are planned to take place. The Commission has selected an overseas helpline provider to provide this service to Bermuda. Negotiations to finalize this deal are ongoing. The Commission has commenced consultation with the betting operators to provide an introduction on problem and responsible gaming with the aim of equipping them to implement responsible gaming best practices as an integral part of their operations. To ensure Bermuda's clin clinicians and faith-based community remain up to date with the latest treatment and prevention techniques, the Commission's training program will be ongoing. Additionally, the Commission has committed to underwrite a prevalence study on the gaming habits of Bermudians. This study will provide important empirical data that will inform its approach in how it continues to educate, equip, and empower the people of Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, the Commission remains committed to engaging with the community of Bermuda to promote socially responsible gaming practices. Mr. Speaker, since inception, the operational costs of the Commission have been funded through a mix of government grants and loans from financial institutions. However, what needs to be echoed to the public and this Honorable House is the extreme fiscal prudency within which the Commission operates. Mr. Speaker, I can report that for each year of operations, the Commission has been prudent and responsible with the public purse and have come in under the original budget estimates. 
I publicly wish to thank the Commission team for their, for their diligence. In the 2019-2020 fiscal year, the government will provide a half million dollar grant to cover some of the operational costs of the Commission. The Commission will seek external financing from local financial institutions to cover their additional operating, operational costs. Mr. Speaker, it is the Commission's desire to eventually become self-funding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The next Minister has a statement this morning. Is that of the Deputy Premier? Deputy Premier, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as the order paper indicates, I will today table a bill in this honorable house to start the process of much needed reform of Bermuda's municipalities. Mr. Speaker, this bill proposes repeal of elections in the corporations of Hamilton and St. George and continue these corporations as flangers. Mr. Speaker, during the debate in 2018, government deferred the municipal elections while making a commitment that we would determine the most appropriate method to strengthen and modernize municipal governance for the betterment of Bermuda. This commitment was repeated in the 2018 throne speech from the throne. A repeal of elections for this year would also realize a savings of approximately $79,000. Mr. Speaker, as an example, the UK Local Government Act 2000, which states that every local authority in the UK was created to achieve one or more of the following, the promotion or improvement to the economic well-being of their area, the promotion or improvement of the social well-being of their area, and the promotion or improvement of the environmental well-being of their area. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, we must ask the question of whether the municipalities are adequately prepared to fulfill, to fully achieve any of the previously stated goals. It is the government's position that neither corporation has the financial resources or expertise to meet the stated objectives. Mr. Speaker, the government has published its vision for the corporation. And I must remind honorable members at this juncture, for the town of St. George, it is envisioned that there will be a mega yacht port and marina with enhanced infrastructure, amenities, and activities. In order to achieve this vision, the following needs must be met. A sustainable management plan for the World Heritage Site, a sustainable and non-seasonal industry, infrastructure and amenities to address the needs of the community, in addition to the businesses, particularly the St. Regis development, general infrastructure upgrades. For the city of Hamilton, Mr. Speaker, it is envisioned a smart city, infrastructure with a thriving residential center, with an entertainment hub, with distinct districts to touch all aspects of city living, including a tourism interface. In order to achieve this vision, the following needs must be met. The, the development of a multifaceted waterfront, mm -hmm. increased city living, increased use of vacant office space, effective traffic management using smart city technology, encouraging the development of districts, example, financial entertainment, restaurant, etc. Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to address some of the concerns raised publicly. One, there have been concerns that the ratepayers with the, within the city limits will no longer have input in the selection of the mayor and the eight councillors. While elections will be repealed, persons who reside, do business, or work in the municipal area have the opportunity to participate in the selection process. Two, the government has no intention at this time to A, dismantle the existing operational structure of each municipality, or B, do away with the positions of mayor or councillors. The government intends to repeal the vote and appoint persons with the expertise and enthusiasm to implement the government's vision. There will continue to be 
a mayor, and a councillor. Three, there will be no loss of jobs in either municipality. Let me repeat that. There will be no loss of jobs in either municipality. However, the government intends to provide more support, more support mm -hmm. to both municipalities. This has already begun, for example, A, the sewage project that is being undertaken by the Ministry of Public Works will replace the work that is being done currently undertaken in the respective corporation and will reduce the proposed capital outlay of $8.5 million over the next three years for the Corporation of Hamilton in particular. B, the Department of Planning is currently producing the management plan for the World Heritage Site in St. George. The status of the World Heritage Site is under threat, in part because of the lack of proper management plan. In addition, the Corporation of St. George does not have the funds to undertake infrastructure repairs and has traditionally appealed for a grant from the government in the amount of between one million to two million dollars. As a result, the government intends to give greater authority, I repeat, greater authority to the Corporation of St. George, both legislatively and financially. Four, it has been said that the crumbling assets and empty buildings have nothing to do with the stewardship of the corporations. It must be noted, Mr. Speaker, however, that some corporation assets have also, are also in a state of disrepair, such as the docks. For investors to take an interest in Bermuda, they must also view our municipalities as thriving entities worth their investments. As stated in consultation document, the corporations are, Mr. Speaker, the lifeblood of the island, and they are a reflection of our economic and social health. Five, there have been accusations that the current administration in both municipalities have not been allowed to continue to the expiry of their terms. Mr. Speaker, the current mayors and councillors will continue to serve until the expiry of their terms on the 13th of May. Six, there will be no asset grab. Let me repeat that. There will be no asset grab, Mr. Speaker. This is not possible, as each municipality will remain a body corporate. Let me, let me repeat that, because that's one of the ones that I've heard repeatedly. There will be no asset grab. This is not possible, as each municipality will remain a body corporate. Mr. Speaker, as far back as 2017, the issue of, potential, of the potential of the development of the waterfront was raised with the Corporation of Hamilton. And the minister was informed that this was not a priority for the corporation. Not a priority, Mr. Speaker. Similarly, he, the minister, raised the possibility of introducing smart city technology into the city and was informed the city did not have the money. Mr. Speaker, it is important that honorable members understand the significance of a smart city. Cities worldwide the top five being Singapore, Barcelona, London, San Francisco, and Oslo, are turning to new technology to search for new approaches and solutions that will improve city transportation, water, waste management, energy usage, and a host of other infrastructure issues that underpin the operation of cities and the lifestyle of urban citizens. Interestingly, the Corporation of Hamilton has recently announced that they are using smart city technology to improve traffic flow. Mr. Speaker, there have been disparaging assertions that the government has not consulted and are not listening to the opinions of those who have made submissions. These assertions could not be farther from the truth. 
While information has been gleaned from the public meetings and surveys, I have also met with a number of stakeholders in both municipalities and have heard their concerns and ideas. While we acknowledge the achievements of both corporations, we must also ensure that they are serving the needs of all the stakeholders. We will also be holding town hall meetings next week. The first meeting will take place on March 5th at 6.30 p.m. at East End Primary School, while the second meeting will take place on March 7th at 5.30 p.m. at the New Testament Church of God Heritage Worship Center. Mr. Speaker, as we have stated previously, the two levels of government, national and municipal, can no longer operate in the economic or decision-making silos, particularly in an island of 22 square miles with 61,000 residents. And the case for changing the status quo has been stronger in recent years. Ongoing reform is often evolutionary and at times revolutionary. In order to rejuvenate our municipalities, we can no longer try to solve 21st century problems with 20th century, or as some have argued so eloquently, 18th century solutions. This bill brings the journey towards achieving this goal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Deputy. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy. The next statement this morning on the order paper is that of the Minister from Community and Cultural Affairs. Minister Berger, would you like to present your statement? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning to the House. Good morning to the Good morning. public. Mr. Speaker, I am most pleased to rise today to provide this Honorable House with an update on the work being done at the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs, and by so doing, attest to the fact that the arts are alive, well, and burgeoning in Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, you will recall that the speech from the throne read on November 9, 2018, articulated this government's commitment to, and I and quote, harness the creativity of Bermuda's artists and expand the community's appreciation of their work and its value. My ministry has made good on this promise, Mr. Speaker, through a number of initiatives and programs, which I shall now elaborate on and share with this honorable house and the people of Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, on February 18th, the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs launched phase one of the art in public buildings, a 2018 throne speech initiative. Artwork by artists Meredith Andrews, James Cooper, Graham Foster, Jade Gibbons, Diana Higginbotham, Alan C. Smith, Dr. Edwin Smith, and Sharon Wilson were hung in Dame Lewis Brown Evans building on the second, third, and fourth floors. The presence of these excuse me. The presence of these beautiful pieces of art, Mr. Speaker, can now be appreciated and admired by members of the public and public servants who make their way through these public areas daily. Art uplifts and moves the human spirit, and certainly these works of art will positively impact viewers. Mr. Speaker, again, I would like to express my gratitude to those artists who were eager to support this public art initiative. Each has expressed their gratitude for this opportunity and have subsequently shared the positive feedback that they are receiving. I'm extremely proud of our talented Bermudian artists and the variety and quality of artistic talent that we have on this island. Mr. Speaker and honorable members, it should be noted that the hanging of art in the Dame Lewis Brown Evans building is only the start of this initiative. The Department of Community and Cultural Affairs has already issued an open call inviting interested Bermudian artists to submit two-dimensional works of art to be considered for other government buildings. The deadline for artists to respond to this invitation is March 8th. Mr. Speaker, the arts not only encompasses visual arts, but the literary arts as well. It has been said that literature is the art of discovering something extraordinary about ordinary people and saying with ordinary words something extraordinary. Literary artistry demands talent, hard work, 
research, time, and dedication. And the writing of a novel or a book of poetry is born from a desire to tell a story about the world we inhabit in a way that holds meaning for its inhabitants. The task for Bermudian literary artists is particularly important given the indispensable role of literature in shining a light and providing a reflective surface upon which to view a society. For the Bermudian writer, constructing our stories is a labor of love. And for those who have taken the additional step of making those stories available to the community by going through the rigorous process of editing and publication, it is really the kind of work that serves as its own reward, given a typical lack of financial remuneration for their efforts. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister responsible for culture, I am therefore delighted to have a mechanism through which to reward excellence in this area and give public recognition to the writers. I am very pleased to stand before you today to recognize the winners of the 2018 Bermuda Literary Awards. Mr. Speaker, the Bermuda Liter Literary Awards were inaugurated by the Bermuda government in 1999 to honor literary achievement by Bermudi Bermudian writers. The competition runs once every five to six years, and books are eligible if they have been published subs subsequent to the previous award cycle. The purpose of offering these awards are, one, to recognize significant contributions to the development of Bermudian culture, two, to honor creative works and uphold the writer's role in society, and three, to preserve and promote the highest standards of Bermudian literature. Mr. Speaker, with these goals in mind, there have been six different categories of awards where writers could compete. The Brian Berlin Prize for Fiction, named after Bermuda's most celebrated novelist. The Prize for Children's and Young Adult Fiction. The Prize for Drama. The Cecil Ann Mawson Prize for Poetry, named after one of our trailblazing poets. The Prize for Nonfiction and the Founders Award. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to say that for the first time, we have added a seventh category of competition, namely the Prize for Cultural Merit. This new prize is offered for books or scripts that are notable for contributing to the preservation of Bermuda's culture, heritage, folk life, or history. Another addition to this year's competition stems from a recognition of the importance of film as, story as a storytelling tool in our society. As a result, the prize for drama is now the prize for drama and screenwriting. And so, in addition to theater and radio scripts, eligibility for this category now includes screenplays that have been made into feature-length films. Mr. Speaker, part of what makes Bermuda Literary Awards so significant is that publication is part of the eligibility required for the awards. This is noteworthy because unpublished manuscripts, no matter how promising, are not considered. Every one of the books under consideration has al already gone through an editing process and made available to the general public. This requirement is part of Bermuda's insistence on raising the bar in terms of expectation of excellence that we wish to see in the area of our literary arts. Mr. Speaker, given this background explanation of the prestigious nature of the Bermuda Liter Literary Awards, it is with great pleasure that I congratulate the winners of this year's competition. In the category of nonfiction, the winning entry is Island Flames by Jonathan Smith, a gripping account of the deaths and racial climate that led to the 1977 riots. In the drama and screenwriting category, we have our first winning screenplay, me and Jezebel by talented filmmaker Lucinda Sperling. The winner of the children's and young adult fiction category is remarkable for the ways in which it makes an important historical event accessible to our young people, our young people's learning about social justice. The winner is Girl Cut by Florence Webb Maxwell, a member of Bermuda's progressive group that brought about desegregation. The winner of the Brylin Berlin Prize for Fiction is Dr. F. Colin Duradin for his novel about the antics of Bermudian boyhood, Fry White Grunts, an area rarely given focus in our literature that Dr. Duradin approaches with humor and relatability. Mr. Speaker, 
Dr. Paul Madden has the enviable distinction of having been awarded the Cecil A. Mawson Prize for Poetry twice in a row in 2012 for his collection entitled The Beachcombers Report and this year for his collection entitled Pilgrimage. Proving that talent often runs in families, the winner of the inaugural prize for cultural merit is Dr. Clarence V. H. Maxwell for Pembroke part of Bermuda's Architectural Heritage Series, published by the Bermuda National Trust. Both Dr. Mas Maxwell and the Trust should be commended for this fine contribution to the preservation of our heritage. And finally, the Founders Award, which is offered for books or scripts published prior to the establishment of the Bermuda Literary Awards in 1999, has been award awarded posthumously to Cyril Outerbridge, Packwood for his brave and valuable text exploring slavery in Bermuda, Chained on the Rock. <clears throat> the National Museum of Bermuda is to be applauded for publishing a second edition of this seminal text in 2012, thus making it available to our community again. Mr. Speaker, each winner is given a prize of $2,000 and was honored in a special ceremony on February 24th. Mr. Speaker, I would like to particularly thank the judges for this year's competition. Mrs. Meredith Eben, Ms. Allen Hollis, Mr. Michael Jones, Mr. Allen C. Smith, Dr. Sajni Talaram. Each of these judges spent a tremendous amount of time reading the entries. There were more than 60 works in total that were considered, and, and they analyzed the strengths of the writing according to rubrics provided by the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, in making these selections, the judges acknowledged that the quality of several submissions was quite high, so much so that judges determined they wanted to offer an honorable mention in each category as follows. Bermuda Maps by Mr. Jonathan Land Evans for nonfiction. Mr. Dale Butler for his play Cinnamon and Second Last Supper. The Great Wave of Tamarind by Ms. Nadia Aguirre in young adult fiction. What We Hold in Our Hands by Ms. Kim Aubrey in fiction, and Ms. Wendy Fulton Sajinsky's Let This Be Enough in Poetry and Hands on the Art of Traditional Crafts and Play in Bermuda by Ms. Shirley Perrin, MBE. Mr. Speaker, I would like to once again congratulate the winners and those receive, receiving honorable mentions in 2018 Bermuda Literary Awards. I hope this will encourage other Bermudian writers to strive for excellence in the literary arts. Mr. Speaker, February is often referenced as Education Month. In keeping with this broad nomenclature, the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs has collaborated with the Ministry of Education by having researcher Dr. Margot Madison McFadden to give talks in our public schools about one of our most esteemed national heroes, Mary Prince. Dr. Mc Madison McFadden had recently been given a grant by the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs to conduct research or Mary Prince. As you know, Mr. Speaker, Mary Prince is famous for her slave narrative, The History of Mary Prince, 1831, which was the first account of the life of a black woman to be published in the United Kingdom. This first-hand description of enslavement, released at a time when slavery was still legal in Bermuda and the British colonies, had a galvanizing effect on the anti-slavery movement. Mary Prince is not only a national hero in Bermuda, she achieved international acclaim for her writings, which helped to end slavery throughout the British Empire. Dr. Margot Madison McFadden has visited a number of our public schools, including Harrington Song, Clearwater Middle School, Padgett Primary, Purvis Primary, Victor Scott School, Elliott Primary, and Northless Primary. Indeed, we are most grateful to Dr. Margot for her research on Mary Prince and her sharing her information with our young people. Bermuda's future. Dr. Madison McFadden will be giving a public lecture about her research findings on the latter days of Mary Prince to the general public in July as part of the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs Emancipation Program. Mr. Speaker, because February is called Education Month, the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs has chosen to highlight the impact of media on black Bermudians and how the media helped shape and influence how we as black people viewed ourselves and were viewed by others. A forum entitled Through a Glass Darkly 
black Bermudians in the media took place on Thursday, 28th of February, yesterday, and it was held in honor of Mr. Montague Egbert Shepper, better known as Monty, for the pioneering role that he played in the arena of radio and television broadcasting. Mr. Shepard established the Capital Broadcasting Company in 1961. This was a remarkable achievement given that the society at the time was dominated by racism and segregation. His broadcasting company was the first to introduce color television to Bermuda and was also the first to secure an affiliation with one, with one of the three television networks in the United States, the ABC network. Mr. Montague Shepard paved the way for many journalists, especially blacks, to enter that field. Indeed, he educated and provided a helping hand up for so many. Therefore, it was most fitting to sal salute Montague Shepard for all that he has done. And I was especially honored to present Mr. Shepard with a plaque as a token of our appreciation for all that he has done for Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, we as a particular grouping of people continue to reflect on and express our historical experience life through painting, storytelling, and other art forms that gives us as a people a sense of cohesiveness, a sense of having a particular irreplaceable value in the world. It is our culture that makes us one people. And as Maya Angelou said, Angelou said, you can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. The arts and creativity are flourishing in Bermuda, and may they continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank, thank you, Minister. The next minister has a statement down this morning. Is that of the Minister National Security, Minister Keynes? If it pleases you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I rise this morning to update this Honorable House on the work performed by the disaster risk reduction and mitigation team during the first two months of this year and the activities scheduled for the coming months. Mr. Speaker, the DRRM team continues its cruise ship contingency planning. During 2018 cruise ship season, the DRRM team engaged the cruise ships and stakeholder agencies for two exercises. The intent is that the lessons learned from these exercises cruise ship that is visiting or passing by Bermuda. Not only is this critical for the safety and security of the cruise ships, the passengers and staff, but, it'll be, but should an incident occur, it is critical in safeguarding the reputation of Bermuda. To develop expertise in this area, a member of the DRRM team attended a cruise ship contingency planning workshop in Miami for three days at the end of January. The trip was paid for by the UK Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. This team member will return in, to Miami uh, for two parts of this workshop later this month. Mr. Speaker, starting at the beginning of the 2019 cruise ship season in April, the DRRM team, together with various seaport security officers, will be coordinating a series of activities with various stakeholders that will involve them responding to major cruise ship incidents, pre preparations for uh, major cruise ship incidents. The intent is to increase all agencies' familiarization and participation of what could be involved in response to a major incident aboard a cruise ship. Mr. Speaker, at present, there are no formal, formal contingency plans should a major incident occur in one of Bermuda's chemical facilities. To increase expertise in that area, a member of the DRRM team attended chemical events workshops held in Miami for two days at the beginning of February. This workshop and the travel costs were paid for by the Public Health England. Mr. Speaker, in order to advance contingency planning, the DRRM team has engaged with Seoul and Rubis to manage the fuel farm at Ferry Reach. On January 24th, a town hall meeting was held at the Bias Station for residents. The intent of the meeting was to encourage stakeholder engagement and to develop contingency plans. Over the next several months, Plans will be developed for the residents and premises 
in the Ferry Reach area so that people understand what actions to take and what not to do should an incident occur. These plans will include evacuation planning for the two prison facilities in the area. Mr. Speaker, the DRRM team will be coordinating Bermuda's involvement in regional tsunami exercise involving Central, Central America, South America, and Caribbean com countries on Thursday, March 14th. This will be a communications exercise between the Tsunami Center, the Bermuda Weather Service, the emergency Me and Emergency Measures Organization agencies. The exercise will allow for the DRRM team to ensure that communications measures are properly functioning and fit for purpose in the, end, in the event of a tsunami emergency. Mr. Speaker, the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Northern Command Military approached the Bermuda government to hold a counter-terrorism exercise at the airport in 2020. Planning is underway with the U.S. and Bermuda agencies for this exercise. The National Disaster Coordinator has been appointed as a lead planner for Bermuda on this initiative. And it is anticipated about 15 representatives from the U.S. will visit Bermuda in March 2019. The tabletop exercise is to test the plans being scheduled for June. The counterterrorism exercise will culminate in a live exercise in 2020, evolving all agencies for, for up to three to four days. Mr. Speaker, on November 6, 2018, Cabinet approved the cybersecurity strategy for Bermuda. The Cybersecurity Governance Board has been appointed with Mr. Ronnie Vera as chair. The existing government cyber security manager has been transferred to the DRRM team, and he is responsible for developing a number of strategies, policies, and guidelines for secure management of the government's information systems. Mr. Speaker, forming part of, D of the DRRM team, the National Event Planning Coordinator is the National Events Planning Coordinator. This team member is engaged with the organization, organizers of large public events in Bermuda to assure that they are safely organized and they are professional in their approach. Active planning is underway for the safety and security of the upcoming events, which include MS, the MS Amlin Triathlon in April, Bermuda Heroes Weekend, and the annual Cup Match Holiday. These public events will be properly organized to, de to de decrease the risk of any major incident that could possibly occur and could lead to injuries and jeopardize Bermuda's reputation. Mr. Speaker, each year, Bermuda diligently prepares for hurricane season. This year, the DRRM team, uh, one of our members, will visit the British Virgin Islands in late March for a workshop on lessons learned from Hurricanes Irma and Maria. This workshop is sponsored by the British Red Cross, and members of the Bermuda Red Cross will also attend. It is anticipated that lessons learned will be valuable to Bermuda. Our Hurricane Preparedness Week will be the last week in June with the Emergency Measures Organizations having its first meeting. Mr. Speaker, the work of the DRRM team is important in ensuing that Bermuda is prepared for any large-scale disaster. We will continue to update this Honorable House on the work and the important work of all departments and units within the Ministry of National Security. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The final statement this morning is in the name of the Minister of Education. Minister. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Good morning, Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, I rise before this Honorable House to provide a final report on the 2018-19 Government Grant Award to the Bermuda College for the purpose of offering financial support to its students. Mr. Speaker, let me first remind my honorable colleagues that since becoming the government in 2017, the Bermuda College has been given an additional $300,000 in their annual grant specifically to provide financial support to students in need. In November 2018, I shared with my honorable colleagues the number of students who benefited from these additional monies during fall 2018. This morning, I want to provide an update on the number of students who were supported and positioned to enroll in the Bermuda College during spring 2019 semester. 
Mr. Speaker, you will recall from its inception, this funding initiative of $300,000 was to be used to financially assist students enrolled in three categories of study at the Bermuda College. One, non-program and program academic division courses. Two, professional and career education, or PACE, programs. Student enrolled in these programs had not previously received, had been eligible to receive financial support. And three, bachelor degree programs offered through the Bermuda College. Mr. Speaker, new students who demonstrate a financial need and current students earning a grade point average of 2.0 or higher are eligible to receive financial support. The financial awards have ranged from 30 to 80 percent of a student's educational costs, with the educational costs defined as the total value of the tuition program plus fees. Mr. Speaker, you may remember that during fall 2018 semester, 132 students received a total of $223,431. 62 students registered in the academic divisions, while 70 students registered with the Division of Career of Professional and Career Education, or PACE. There are 33 students in the PACE division who enrolled in the Bachelor of Business Administration degree in partnership with Mount St. Vincent University, and six enrolled in the teacher certification programs offered in partnership with the University of the West Indies. These awards range from $203 to $8,600, with an average award of $1,693 for the semester. Mr. Speaker, in the spring 2019 semester commenced in January. A total of 66 students were awarded grants in the academic divisions. However, no awards were granted by the PACE division for this semester as the allocated funding to PACE was all utilized during the fall semester. Mr. Speaker, I am most pleased to share this morning that a total of 198 awards were offered to students in financial need during the 2018-2019 academic year. These awards range from $233 to $8,600 with the higher amount awarded to students enrolled in the Bachelor of Business Administration degree program offered in partnership with Mount St. Vincent University and students enrolled in the Teacher Certification program offered by the University of West Indies. Mr. Speaker, Reflecting over the last two years, during the 2017-18 academic year, 313 students were financially supported. This current academic year, 198 students received funding. Thus, Mr. Speaker, it gives me great pleasure to state that a total of 511 awards were granted to students who ordinarily would not have had the money to support their tertiary education at the Bermuda College. These students include those who did not meet the Bermuda College's financial aid criteria, but demonstrated a need for financial support, particularly non-traditional students enrolled in the PACE division, which many work a job during the day and attend classes at night. The funding has also supported students who receive limited funding through Bermuda College's financial aid package, thus providing financial aid more reflective of the student's actual needs. Mr. Speaker, this government has determined, is determined to create accessibility to Bermuda College for students in financial need, and this is what we have done. In addition to helping to augment student enrollment, the Bermuda College has expressed appreciation for the additional funding during the last two years and is grateful that the government has seen fit to continue this funding for the upcoming 2019-2020 fiscal year. (coughs) Mr. Speaker, this government is committed to seeing an increase in the number of Bermudians acquire post-secondary educational qualification and will continue to lead the way in demonstrating the value of achieving a higher level education to further lend to the economic landscape of this country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. That brings us to a close of the statements this morning. But before I move on to the next item on the order paper, I'd just like to acknowledge in the gallery this morning, we have from the Parks Department, the Mr. Roger Paris and Mr. Sam Satushi, who are supervisors of the Bermuda Skills Development Program, but the reason we're acknowledging them is that they have visiting officers who have been in for the last two weeks doing a training program for their staff, and I think the three officers are with you this morning are Nick Evans and Chris and Nick Collins.
College, is it correct? And we'd just like to acknowledge the fact that you've been here assisting our Parks Department in developing their skills. Thank you. Reports of committees? There are none. Question period. The question period. So on the order paper this morning, there is a written request from the Honorable Member Dunkley to the Honorable Premier. I understand that the response to that is actually going to be held over until Monday, and it's a, a written response that we'll receive on Monday. The, that moves us on to the questions that have arisen out of the statements that were given this morning, and we have members who would like to put uh, statements to men questions to ministers based on those statements. And the first question this morning would be to the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier, uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll do the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance, you have a question this morning from the Honorable Member from Constituency 8, Honorable Member Carl Simons, would you like to put your question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the statement indicated that the Commission had, engagements, had engaged discussions with the three local banks in, in regards to the Gaming Commission. Can the Minister tell us what was achieved at those meetings and what were the measurable outcomes as a result of the meetings with the three local banks? Thank you. Minister? Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Commission met with the banks to discuss the provision of local banking services to the casino industry. Um, the fundamental issue around correspondent banking remains a roadblock, and I think the first step is to kind of understand whether a local bank would be prepared to work with the gaming industry, and the second step, should one of those banks be interested in working with the gaming industry, would be to procure the services of a correspondent bank. That has not been achieved yet. Thank you. Uh, member? Supplementary or new question? Uh, su supplemental. Continue. So what plans do we have to address this challenge going forward? Minister? We will continue to engage banks to work through the challenges of finding an appropriate correspondent bank and we'll update the House as uh, progress is made. Thank you. Supplementary, new question. New question. Continue. The statement says, further discussion will be carried out with the BMA as banking regulation, regulator and the U.S. correspondent banks. Have, has the Commission met with any U.S. correspondent banks at this point in time? Minister. Uh, the Commission did indeed meet with a correspondent bank as uh, far back as uh, November, December of 2016, when the issue around correspondent banks had been flagged to the Commission, to the prior chairman at that time. Thank you. Supplementary or new question? Supplementary. Thank you. Which corresponding banks did they meet with, and what was the outcome of those meetings? Minister. Mr. Speaker, we met with the Bank of New York. Uh, the outcome of that, those meetings were that we continued to look for a correspondent bank. At the time of those meetings, which was when I was actually leading the effort when I, as an employee at Butterfield Bank, um, the Bank of New York had some concerns around uh, money laundering and terrorist financing and sorrow gaming as a high-risk activity. Uh, we discussed opportunities to uh, uh, revise or construct a framework for gaming that will be uh, designed to mitigate the risk uh, foreseen by the correspondent banks, and we still continue to kind of work on what the framework would look like. Thank you. Supplementary, new question. Supplementary. Mm -hmm. Has the issue of banking for the gaming industry been discussed with the Signature Bank of New York? Minister? Not to my knowledge. New question? Uh, are they going to pursue this avenue? 
That was a new question, you know, because we're in a supplement. No, 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 you had your two supplement you had supplementaries. That was a new question, see? So that's your third okay, question. That's, third your, question. that's your third question. So you can do it. You can let him answer it now, or, or, you, or you're going to continue my with that. My third question. Okay, is, well, do your third, you question, do your third pursue, question there. Are you going to pursue this possibility with the Signature Bank now that they are looking at the fintech industry? Speaker, I think it's a wonderful suggestion. I might take the member up on that. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, Minister, you have another member who would like to put questions to you on your statement this morning. It's the member from Constituency 10. Um, would you like to put your question, member? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning to you and colleagues and those in the listening audience. The question to the Honorable Minister of Finance. On page, the bottom of page 2, the Honorable Minister says, uh, give some details about the recruitment process for the a vacant executive director position, and that it was advertised locally and overseas four times in August 2017, March 2018, October 2018, and January 2019. Can the minister respond to this honorable house? How many applicants have applied each time? Thank you. Minister? Speaker, I don't have that, those, th those figures at my disposal. Can I get back to the honorable member with the answer? Thank you. Supplementary or new question? Um, I accept that answer, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to the commitment. But uh, supplementary, which the Honorable Minister probably won't be able to answer, but I'd, I'd ask that he get back um, when he does with the other answer. I assume that since the position hasn't been filled, all of those applicants would be considered unsuitable. So I'd just like confirmation that for that. And um, um, another question, Mr. Speaker? Second question, Mr. Speaker. So uh, that's a supplementary, which is assuming that uh, the position hasn't been filled. That I, well, well, once you hold that until he gets that information back to you there. But there's a second question, which I'm sure he'll need to get the answer back as well. Okay. And so, that is they, all the applicants lack suitability. All right. So that's your supplementary to the information he's looking for. That's correct. Yeah. All right. Now put your second question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Honorable Minister, uh, can the Honorable Minister give his... Uh, reasoning and understanding of why it has been so hard to attract uh, somebody suitably qualified to the position of executive director. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'll take them in the order in which they were asked. I will certainly get back to the member with respect to confirming why applicants were uh, not successful in the process. It could have been either not being suitable or not deciding to pursue the process any further. With respect to the third question, I guess I would answer it with the question, how long is the piece of string? I don't know. Supplementary? Yes, Mr. Yes. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, supplementary. Um, now that we've gone into the engagement process for an executive recruiter, what is the budget for that process? <coughs> Minister? Speaker, as with the prior questions, I will undertake to get back to the honorable member with an answer to that question. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Supplementary on that one, yes. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, has a firm been identified as of yet? Minister. I will get back with the honorable member with an answer to that one as well. Thank you. No further questions? Minister. We'll now move on to the next statement that there are questions for, and we'll go to the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier, the opposition leader would like to put a question to you in regard to your statement this morning. Honorable Dep um, opposition leader, your question to the deputy. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. No uh, problem. Apologies. Yeah, on um, <clears throat> the honorable member mentioned um, this page, it's not uh, numbered the page, but uh, one, I would say page three, um, down under item three uh, B, uh, the honorable member says, the status of the World Heritage Site is under threat in part uh, because of lack of proper management plan. And I just was curious, uh, as they have been working with the uh, corporation, 
could he shed some light on some of the other areas that have been threatening uh, the heritage site other than just a uh, proper management plan? Minister? To be precise to the question, the overseeing of the, of the World Heritage designation has been in, not in the hands directly of the Corporation of St. George, but a committee themselves, and they had responsibility for maintaining the uh, requirements to, okay, to maintain the plan, and they did not produce any plan, so that is what has put the situation to where it is. And essentially, I guess they didn't have the funding or the expertise to actually produce the plan, which is why the government took over responsibility for producing the plan. Thank you. Supplementary, new question. Yeah, no, uh, new question. Go ahead. Uh, further on down, um, the Honorable Member states that um, <clears throat> as a result, the government intends to give greater authority to the Corporation of St. George's, both legislatively and financially. I can understand financially what they mean by that. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, that means they will be giving uh, more monies will be available to the uh, corporation. But legislatively, I was wondering, what is that greater authority that will be given to the corporation uh, legislatively? It was, it's kind of vague. Thank you. Minister? Thank you. Thank you for the question, um, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. We intend to give the future corporation the legal authority over the management of the World Heritage Site designation. Thank you. Supplementary? No. no further questions? Good. We move on to the next statement this morning. And Minister of National Security, there are actually three members who have indicated they have questions for you today. And the first is in the name of the member from Constituency 31, Honorable Member Smith. You have the floor. Good morning, Mr. Speaker and colleagues. Mr. Speaker, can I have the Honorable Minister provide what the budget is for 2018 and 2019 for the DRRM? Minister? The, the DRRM does not have a budget per se. At this present moment, Mr. Speaker, we have taken uh, members from under, their under secondment from specific government departments. For example, a person from the customs department will sit in the office. A person from the police have sat in the, uh, are sit in the office. And so whilst we're putting together uh, this particular department for 2018-2019, we, we, we have this department that is in our office on an ad hoc basis until we work, work some, out some of the logistics. Supplementary? S supplementary. Continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, would the Honorable Minister be able to provide an estimated amount that has been spent so far for this? Again, so far, the, there is not a specific budget that has been set aside. The, the, there has not been a budget that was set aside. The DRRM, they are working from the individual departments. The only thing that is different is that they are sitting in our office and working together as a team. Thank you. Supplementary? Supplementary. Second supplementary. The, the funds, will they be taken from other departments? So are you able to... At, at this point, the salaries uh, of each person in the DRRM comes from their individual departments, yes. Supplementary? Uh, supplementary. Supplementary. Okay. supplementary. Yes. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, considering that these individuals are actually doing work for this new entity, is it reasonable to expect that funds will be wired from these initial ministries to the now revised ministry? Okay, the responsibility. Uh, that, that, re that, re that, okay. that remains a work in progress. So let's go back to the, let's go back to the beginning and to the genesis. And over the last year, members would members would under, would remember when we bought uh, this concept initially to the house and we shared that the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, highlighted for all of the overseas territories that they wanted us to put together disaster risk and reduction units in our country. We realized that it was important and it was being mandated for the o OTs to have this department up and running. And so rather than put it off and rather than uh, wait, we thought it not robbery, to take everyone from their particular departments and put together a team. Prior to this, the departments are run by the emergency measures organization, and they will come together on an ad hoc basis, i.e., if there was an emergency. 
we thought it important to put together a national disaster risk and reduction strategy for the government. What is taking place right now until we are able to regularize the budget, we are taking secondees from different de government departments and these secondees all of their salaries are still appropriated and coming from their individual departments. The only thing is that right now they all sit in the, de the Department of National Security's headquarters, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Supplementary and new question. No, you used all your supplementaries. New question. New question. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if the Honorable Minister is able to give us a breakdown of the personnel that is being used from all the different departments. Uh, Minister? There, it, uh, there is a principal customs officer, Kelly Trott, representing customs. There is a divisional fire officer, Mr. Ferbert, that represents the fire department. There is warrant officer, uh, class two, Rubain, that represents the Bermuda, the, uh, Bermuda Regiment. There is the Mr. Steve Cosham, who is the head of the department. We have representing the Bermuda Police Service. You have Mr. Sergeant Lyndon Rayner, who is responsible for the policing side. Thank you. Supplementary, no further questions. Thank you. Minister, the next individual, next member, who indicated I have a question for you is the member from Constituency 10. And remember, Dunkley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Minister has informed this Honorable House that the members are within the Ministry of National Security fulfilling that role. Who is fulfilling the role and responsibility that all of those members had in their original jobs? Minister? That, 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 is, that, is, that is actually a brilliant question. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and, and, but I wouldn't go that far. No, the, re the, re the, re the, re the reason the reason why it's a brilliant question, because that is what all of their department heads are asking. Um, they're asking who's fulfilling those roles. Mm -hmm. Again, Mr. Speaker, and, th and this is something that we have to understand as a country. This is something that we have to do as a country, and yes. this was put on us at the last minute. We are putting together a team to, to be able to re regularize our international sta standards with reference to disaster, risk, and reduction. And this is something that is currently a, a work in progress. Of course, um, those positions and, 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 and the leaders in those particular departments want those people to have their position to regularize because they're operating in many circumstances with one man down, but we have to continue to make sure that Bermuda's overall security is, is managed. Thank you. Supplementary, new question. Supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Um, thank the minister for the compliment, but the answer was really not that complete. So supplementary question. Are those positions full-time within the DRRM? I, I really don't know how to break this down any, more, any further. You know, I've said it three times, that they have been seconded over, Mr. Speaker. Does, uh, Mr. Speaker, that they have been seconded over, that the, that the positions we are in the process of regularizing that, at present, they have been seconded over, Mr. Speaker, and that is four times. Supplementary? Yes, uh, my supplementary. supplementary. Yes, thank you. If the minister can confirm that if they are seconded over, presumably that he's now saying that it's a full-time basis, mm -hmm. then the initial premise ought to be that they must be paid. Therefore, one of the first steps ought to have been, or ought not the first step, to have been to transfer the funding to ensure that they are paid rather than to have the cost center from which each individual member coming being responsible for their salaries. Just accounting from an account so, question. Uh, what was your question? I'm waiting for your question. So, the question was, uh -huh. would it not have been appropriate to transfer the funding to pay people who have now moved over on a secondi basis to transfer the okay. money from point A to point B for them to be paid under okay. that cost set? You got your point. No. Thank no, you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary, uh, members, members, supplementary, new question. Supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Is your second supplementary? Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister um, said in an answer to previous questions that he's unable to say how much money has been spent. He was unable to say how much the budget is. So can the Minister assure this Honorable House that they've stayed within the budget for the Ministry and will see no supplementaries during this budget debate? Minister. There, 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 there is an, op there is a, Mr. Speaker, there is an opportunity for us to understand, understand what this government is doing. 
There is an opportunity for us to create a disaster risk and, and, and reduction strategy for this nation. This was thrust on this government in the middle of the fiscal year. We did not abdicate our responsibility. We then moved around key chess pieces to ensure that this government had the necessary personnel in place. We have had the opportunity to do so. We have done so in accordance with financial instructions. When the opportunity presents itself, we will regularize the position and to make sure that this is done in a formal manner, Mr. Speaker. We have the opportunity to meet on a regular basis with each of the department heads in our ministry. They have the opportunity to test and adjust their position with reference to personnel. It is always our mission and aim to make sure that each and every one of the ministries in our remit have the necessary personnel, they have the appropriate budget, and they have the direct opportunity to lead in this country. With reference to budget, my learned friend has a copy of, of the headings, and at the appropriate time, we can debate the appropriate uh, uh, parts of this budget. New question. Uh, Mr. Speaker. New, um, new question. No, just answer the question. Wait, 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 now. wait, now. Let's, wait, let's, let's understand where we are. It's on question and answer. You've had two supplementaries. If you want to get on your feet again, you've got to put in your second new, question. New question. Thank you. Yes. The new question is, will there be supplementaries in regard to this program? Minister? No. Thank you. Supplementary? We have two supplementaries. Good. Mr. Speaker, and, and I, I preface by saying if I didn't hear this, then I apologize in the beginning. I haven't heard any indication, I haven't heard any indication that with all the services that are covered, that there's anyone there that's been seconded with respect to what I call the medical and social services area. At the, at, at the stage, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and i just go again, uh, Mr. Speaker. This Department of Disaster, Risk, and Reduction, it's in its genesis. There are a number of elements when we're talking about the EMO. The E, the Emergency Measures Organization, takes key members from each part of the government ministries when there is a national disaster. This, is, this, is, this still exists. So if we have a national disaster, uh, all of the key elements for government come into the place. We have taken four key, ministry, uh, four key elements of our ministry and we put them together to form the reduction team. When there is a part of our strategy that requires someone to do with medicine or other key places, they will seek the expertise from that person to uh, uh, work with the, the national strategy with reference to protecting Bermuda government as it relates to medical and medical related instances. Thank you. Would you like to put your supplementary now on this? Yes, yeah. my supplementary is in respect of the earlier uh, answer, Mr. Speaker, and the question is, has there been or is there overfunding in the Ministry of National Security at the moment, such overfunding such that people coming in are being able to be paid out of the budget of national security without having the environment from the other ministries? We, 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 uh, Mr. Speaker, I've answered that question. Mr. Sup second supplementary. S second supplementary. The minister has not answered the question, is there funding and a funding excess in the Ministry of National Security so that that ministry can pay people coming over? Or will there be a supplementary environment from their original ministries to the Ministry of National Security? It's just a basic accounting question. It's not meant to try to trap anybody. It's a pure accounting question. I think, I think the answer thus far has been, been no on all the other counts, but Minister, Mr. if you Speaker, like perhaps to I can clarify it. Minister Finance. Uh, there's no contemplation of any supplementals to the budget for 2019-2020. 2018-2019, I'm sorry. Thank you. Supplementary? Yes. Supplementary, Mr. S Mr. Speaker. Um, bearing in mind that the, the areas that have been um, chosen, I, I just I can't believe that, and I'd like the, the minister to indicate to me, normally when something constitutes a disaster, there's, there's some sort of element in terms of people and, and things that have happened on such a global nature, I don't understand why there wouldn't have been someone from what I call the medical or social services 
uh, seconded to that group because you're planning. This is all about planning. And I just wonder if, if there's any reason why this group was overlooked or was it because they're just not part of na national security? Um. I think you stretched your question a little bit because it doesn't necessarily fall in line with his statement because in the statement he spoke about the persons under his ministry. Health isn't necessarily under his ministry. So, so he's speaking to what has put in place under his ministry of his personnel. Okay. You want to adjust your question, no? All right. Um, the minister, you still have another member who has a question for you, though. We have the minister from the member from Constituency Eight, Honourable Member Simons. I acknowledge that the minister is in transition in regards to the DRRM team, but my question is: in the interim, what cyber protocols and procedures are in place for each ministry? Minister. Uh, m m Mr. Mr. Speaker, I have been in the uh, ho House and I have done at least three ministerial statements with reference to what we're doing and cybersecurity ministerial statements. I would urge that, that, that member to have a listen the next time we give it, but I will give it again. Now, now, now just give it the facts. Give it facts. Mr. Speaker, with the, greatest, with the greatest of respect, we have shared with the House that we have a uh, a cybersecurity uh, ministerial, uh, excuse me, ministerial subcommittee that meets on a regular basis. We have a, so, and, uh, uh, there was another person on our team. We have a person that is specializes in our cybersecurity strategy. Uh, his name is, is stored and his last name escapes me. That is putting together the cybersecurity plan for each government department. Uh, the cybersecurity cyber strategy is something that has been a work in progress for, for the last 18 months and that is robust, and that indeed is looking at plans with patching, with plans to training, with plans on development, and looking at the government's uh, uh, infrastructure with reference to uh, protecting the IT biosphere. Thank you. Supplementary, a new question. Supplementary. Go ahead. So which, what international benchmark are the plans and the protocols measured against? Minister. They, there is a global standard that is put together by NIST. NIST is a national organization that is responsible for cybersecurity. We also have the foreign, excuse me, the, the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization has worked to Bermuda to put together the national cybersecurity strategy. I have shared with, this, with, with our house the national cybersecurity strategy on, on, on a previous occasion, setting out in a ministerial statement the part for the, the, the national cybersecurity strategy. Each of the elements are there. They rise to global standards. And indeed, um, each government department and, and working with uh, the ministry, we have a, a national cybersecurity plan that, that is now in the public domain. Thank you, Minister. Supplementary, new question? New question? Supplement, supplementary. Second, second supplementary. So with that in place, when can he assure the government employees that all departments will be fitted with the national cybersecurity plan. So I know he was working on it. When does he envision having it completed for each department? Minister? I, 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 didn't, I didn't get the question. Can you help me? I apologize, Mr. Speaker. Can you repeat the question for me, please? He's looking for a timeline as to when it will be completed for each department. Each department has, each department has a strategy uh, each department has this, the, the parts of the strategy that is key for their ministry has been distilled down for that ministry. Let's just talk about training for a second. The biggest part that we, that we, have, that we have seen was the training and preparation for, for understanding the cybersecurity in each department. The training has taken place where each member of government every month has a cybersecurity a plan that they have to answer and, and, and security questions that they have to answer. There are specific people in each department through ITO that understand their remit for the specific infrastructure that, that they are in charge of. So there are two parts to the strategy. The first part of the strategy is the ITO department. The ITO department has the key personnel that are overall responsible for running the government's program. Within the ministry, we have a cybersecurity ma um, a manager, Stuart. Stuart's responsibility is for managing the overall government uh, strategy. He then polices the people at ITO, making sure that they are putting on the patches, that the government cybersecurity strategy is being enacted. 
Yes? So the third part is everybody that works in government having and understanding their part they have to play with keeping their desktop or, or the, the, their, their service together. That has been cascaded down to each government department with a, a, a security survey and a test that is given once per quarter to each government official. So three parts, Mr. Speaker. The, the three parts are the government has a, a cyber security manager that is in, within the DRM. He is responsible for the overall cyber security strategy. Then you have the ITO department of managers who cascade down and are responsible for each department and the cyber security team. Then you have the third layer, which are all the 5,000 government employees that are responsible for making sure the cyber security on their desktop or in, on their uh, uh, tablet, making sure they're responsible for that. I hope that's helpful, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Any further questions? No further questions. Minister, that completes the questions to you. The last statement this morning that members have indicated they have questions for is that of the Minister of Education. And Minister, the Honorable Member from Constituency 8, Honorable Member Simons, would like to put a question to you regarding your statement. Member? Uh, just one simple question. Um, the statement indicates, and I quote, the financial awards have ranged from 30% to 80% of a student's educational cost. How does the awards committee define whether a student will get 30% of its cost or 80% of its cost, and what criteria do they use? Thank you. Minister? Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, just like how students apply for financial aid, they apply for, they apply for um, access to these financial funds. That it, it is the Bermuda College. Um, Bermuda College admissions will then determine whether their financial need is of such that they can get some of these funds. Thank you. Supplementary? Supplementary? Yes, just a quick uh, supplementary. Could the minister confirm whether the determination is made based on combined family income or is it just specific to the student's financial situation? Minister? M Mr. Speaker? Um, I would have to endeavor to get the criteria from the Bermuda College, but I have been assured that the purpose of these funds is to ensure students who normally would not be able to afford to attend the Bermuda College get funding. I'm unsure why the opposition will want to question the Bermuda College's vetting process on ensuring that these 511 people who have benefited from this program should have, been bene should have benefited from this program. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary? Have Supplementary. You, yes. yes, the minister has misled. We are not questioning uh, anything with respect to the people who... One sec, one sec. Let me hear a question. With out. respect to the people who have earned, who have gotten the, the benefits of the grants. The question was simply, is it based on family income? We don't deny or begrudge anybody getting additional assistance. We're just trying to determine whether it's based on family income or this, this individual student's circumstance. And the only reason okay. is, in asking that question, Mr. Speaker, for clarity to the minister, is just to ensure that if there is a family member who can assist, whether that is going to be considered or whether the student's own individual specific financial situation is the only determining criteria. The minister can get that information. I'd be, just, I'd be happy to hear it. Certainly don't begrudge the students or their ability for their education. Okay. For minister? Their education. Mr. Mr. Speaker, once again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss to understand why we want to ask this question. Um, if we're talking about a student who has no family, what is the criteria then? If we're talking about a student, we're talking about a student who may have, who may well, have Minister, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me help, let me help you out, Minister. You seem to be confused. It's simply an answer of, does the criteria take in just the individual, or does the criteria take in the family as well? And if that, that's basically what it's asking. And Mr. Speaker, I, and my reply to that is, I don't see why it's relevant, but I will ask and get back to the Minister, 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 I'm trying to keep it where we don't get to off turn here, right? I think it is a relevant question. That's why I'm assisting. Okay, so, so, so no, 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 no. I think you should take your seat while I'm talking anyway. Take your seat. I think it's a relevant question. 
and you just need an answer. It either the individual or it's the family. And it's not belittling the student, it's not belittling the family, it's a, what's the criteria? But you know why I'm, I'm, I'm doing this? Because if one of my constituents asks me, I need to know what the criteria is. I think we're all asking for that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I will be guided by your direction, and I will endeavor to get the criteria from Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to a... That, I missed that. I missed that. You know what? Wait, 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 wait. You know why I assisted in the question just now? Because I didn't want us to go down the wrong road. I didn't want us to go there. I spoke to try to keep us on a proper level. I'm not going to allow us to go down the wrong track. It's early in the day. We've got a long day ahead of us. Let's understand that. We're going to stay at a proper level this entire day, or people are going to be leaving this chamber. Is that clear? Is that clear? Thank you. No. That brings us to a close of the question and answer period this morning, and we'll move on to the next matter on the order paper. Congratulatory and obituary speeches. Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last week, because of time constraints, I did not have the opportunity to ask that this Honorable House join me in sending condolences to the family of the late Franklin Dialli. You might recall, Mr. Speaker, that Frank Dialli served on our police service for a significant period of time, having come to Bermuda uh, from Grenada originally via the UK and into Bermuda, uh, where he had married his wonderful wife, Winifred. Uh, Frank is the husband of Winifred, the father of both Ian and Samantha, and he just is a very good family friend. But as the news of his death was um, announced, Mr. Speaker, you will recall that he was actually the officer who was on duty at Government House on the night that the former... Uh, governor, uh, uh, governor uh, Sir Richard Sharples and his ADC, Mark Sayers, and their dog were actually shot on the grounds of Government House, and he was the sole officer on duty at that time. Frankie also, um, on the lighter side of things, was actually a member of a very popular UK rock band called Hot Chocolate, and it was very interesting the impact that his band had on music in the late 60s, early 70s, and actually right into the 80s after Frank had already actually left Hot Chocolate and come to Bermuda. So I just ask that condolences be sent to his family. I would also ask that congratulations be sent to the uh, Ord Road uh, Paget Primary School. That Paget Primary School very recently, Mr. Speaker, this past week, in celebration of uh, Black History Month, had a classroom exercise in which each of the classes was required to highlight a popular figure from Bermuda uh, where they could um, identify and, excuse me, and represent them in their classroom uh, environments uh, to represent what those individuals contributed to Bermuda. I was actually made aware of it because my father, the late Dr. E.F. Gordon, was one of those that was chosen by Class 4 Smith to uh, make a presentation and to do a an exhibit. And they were absolutely first class, Mr. Speaker. But among some of the others, we had uh, former Premier Jennifer Smith. We had former member Nalisa Butterfield. We had the Talbot brothers. We had Nikki Saunders. We had Fred Ming. We had uh, actually the, pre the current Premier, um, David Burt. We had um, Hubert Smith, Sir John Swan. There was just a plethora of individuals, but the exhibits themselves, Mr. Speaker, were absolutely first class. And the little ambassadors who showed people throughout the exhibits, um, they were so enthusiastic and they deserve our congratulations. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I would ask that this House send congratulations to the Youth Parliament in their debate this past weekend at Southampton Princess, where they debated the uh, worth or lack thereof of the sugar tax, and they did an excellent job. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, Speaker. Member. Does any other member wish to speak? Do we recognize the Minister of Transport, Minister De Silva? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like the House to send um, a letter of condolences 
to the family of Mr. Alex Swan, who passed away yesterday. That's, oh. Yeah. Oh. Uh, that's Valerie Deal's uh, yeah. brother. Yeah. Uh, so if we could do that, it'd be much entire, Include the whole house with that, I think. Yes, and, yeah. and yes, yes, the whole house is associated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swan. Thank you. Uh, speaker. Um, does any other member wish to speak? We recognize the honorable member from constituency one. Honorable member Swan, you have the floor. Peace. Peace, Mr. Speaker. Two, rather. Yes, two. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, I would like to be associated with those condolences uh, to uh, the family of the late Alex Swan, a cousin, and a gentleman I always admired, a, a silent giant behind the scenes um, there at uh, John W. Swan Limited in the real estate section. Mm -hmm. And I know um, all of those persons passed and um, that worked there um, mourning this gentleman's passing. In addition, Mr. Swan was a stalwart in the football community and the club administration community with his association, with his proud association with PH, PHC. And anyone who knows the uh, type of Persons that associated themselves with clubs like PHC knew um, that there was a time when my clubs in Georgia's Cricket Club way back in the day needed uh, help and uh, PHC for, for, um, forefathers came to the rescue, which is why some might wonder why PHC has such a lovely spot at St. George's to watch cup match. And certainly this year when we win the cup back, uh, we will be remembering Alex, when we, I'm glad you we got a good imagination, client, Mr. Speaker. But I certainly um, would like my uh, condolences associated with uh, the Honorable Member Zane De Silva uh, to go out to his family uh, here and, and, and abroad. His, his brother out is, is a Methodist uh, minister in, in, in Canada. Uh, Valerie is, is other one of his other brothers, a celebrated. Uh, physician uh, in Bermuda deceased and 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 his entire uh, family mr. 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 speaker um, he has done great uh, great things uh, in the business community and um, in the uh, sporting world and I'm sure in other areas that I might not even be aware uh, thank you mr. speaker thank you honorable member and now I recognize honorable member commission honorable member you have the floor Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I uh, did not intend to get up after hearing uh, the, of the, uh, the death of Mr. Alex Swan. Uh, like the two colleagues preceding me, I had to get up and say uh, that Mr. Swan was iconic, a pioneering figure in Bermuda's black community over the last 40 or 50, 60 years. We heard this morning a fitting tribute to uh, Montague Shepherd, certainly Mr. Swan belongs in that group, that generation, along with a number of others, who paved the way in terms of black business development, entrepreneurship within our community. He also had an abiding love and interest in the overall welfare of Bermuda and Bermudians. I can't recall the numbers of times that Mr. Swan would pull me aside as a good family friend, our families had a background in PHC, and would give me advice on the, the latest political uh, issues of the day. He was so multifaceted. He was a Renaissance man. And I'm speaking with some emotion here because, again, I have a deep and re abiding respect for Mr. Alex Swan. And that generation of which he was such a part of laid the foundation for the Bermuda that we have today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Does any other Honorable Member? We recognize Honorable Member from Constituency 28. Honorable Member, you have the floor. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. First off, I'd like to send congratulations to the Harvest Primary School. For last week, they held their science fair. I also like to associate MP2, even though it's not the house, we both attended last week. And we were thoroughly impressed by the projects that the students in, their, in the school came up with. It reminded me of not too long ago when I was in school and had the same science projects that 
we have to do, and I was thoroughly impressed. Also, I'd like to associate with the congratulate by the uh, honorable member Pat Gordon for the Paget Primary and their Black History event that they put on. Also, Mr. Speaker, while we have in the gallery Dr. Karika Weldon, we like to I'd like to congratulate her for putting on the gala last week for the Bermuda Principles Foundation. Uh, it went over very well. Mm -hmm. And I, I might as well associate the whole house. Yes. And also associating along with Pat Gordon, the youth parliament debate last week, Saturday, where the proposition won their debate in support of the sugar tax. So, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to con send congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. I now recognize Honorable Member Weeks. Honorable Member Weeks, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to you. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to start off by associating myself with the remarks about Mr. Alex Swan. I didn't know him when I was younger, but as a, as a man, I was um, one of his colleagues at the Leopards Club and had the, had the opportunity to learn a lot from him then. You know, not only about club life, he talked a lot about sports. I went to school with um, one of his daughters, so I knew his, his family well. He was, he was definitely a good man, and he will be a big miss. Mr. Speaker, on a, on a um, warmer note, I would like to um, have the House recognize the exploits of Mr. Ottawa Simmons. Mr. Speaker, last Sunday, some colleagues and I were invited to St. Philip's Church to um, the little church by the sun, yes, and that church, their youth, their youth um, ring, were putting on a Black History event, and the and the theme was celebrating Ottawa Simmons. Mr. Speaker, I had to be there because Mr. Ottawa Simmons was has always been not only an icon to myself but to our community. When I got down to the church, I was a little late. And I was expecting to run into standing room only. We have to try to, to appreciate and recognize, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, those that have gone before us while they're still here. So um, I enjoyed my time, and I know, and I saw you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and the Honorable Minister of Education holding hands and singing Kumbaya. But um, Mr. Simmons was definitely... Uh, appreciative of all that we had done for him, Mr. Speaker, and um, we wish him, wish him well and many more years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Simons, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise to um, associate myself with his comments made in regards to Alex Swan, Padre Primary, and Dr. Corico Weldon. I went to our event on Friday night, and I can say I, I, I left the event knowing a bit more about DNA splicing and the benefits of, of its application to spinal injuries. Um, it was something that I would never have gone to, but um, I think I grew scientifically as a result of that awarding experience. I'd like to also um, say con um, congratulations to Julia Snelling and her charity is supporting public schools. Um, last week they had a fundraiser and no fundraiser and they raised seventy thousand dollars. And um, Juliana also was able to get ninety second hand uh, computers for our schools from Lombard ODA and Fidelity International. To me, that is a worthwhile contribution from our our corporate community, and I salute them for the commitment to education. I'd like to also acknowledge the fact that the charity supporting public schools has donated over $110,000 towards school supplies as of June of last year. So again, congratulations. Keep up the good work. The community acknowledges you and praises you for your contribution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The chair recognizes uh, the Honorable Minister of Education, D.L.O. Rabin. 
Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, first on a sad note, I'd like to have um, a letter of condolences sent to the family, of the Benjamin family of um, Loyal Hill and, and our associate, um, <laughs> associate uh, Pat Gordon Pamplin, I would say PGP, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, who does who does live who does live on Lower Hill as well is unfortunate. I spoke to the family last night, and um, I have met um, Roderick on um, numerous times when canvassing up there, and it was just um, one of those things where he was just suddenly found um, unresponsive. So, a uh, letter of uh, condolences sent to that. And Mr. Speaker, I do want to touch on some of the things that were said uh, previously with uh, Paget Primary School. Uh, this 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 occasion happened to be their second annual Black History Museum. Uh, function that they put on. Um, they actually outdone themselves this year. I think um, well, one, of the, uh, one of the displays that we must uh, pay very close attention to was the one that was done specifically by the ASD classroom that honored uh, the current premier, um, uh, the Honorable David Burke. It was a phenomenal display put on by um, these young children who range in age from uh, P3 all the way up to P5. Uh, with that, also I'd like to join my colleague in congratulating Purvis Primary for their um, science fair. This is the third time I've attended their science fair as well, and it's something that it's um, an annual event and something that I also look forward to. I also want to say, give congratulations to all of the students who put artwork into the, the annual primary school artwork um, display that is currently um, happening at City Hall. And if anyone out there has not visited, I encourage you to go and visit and see what some of our people are doing. Again, joining my colleagues um, with the performance put on by St. Philip AME YPD um, this Sunday. And what he did not, what um, um, Brother um, Beach did not mention is that the deputy speaker took part in the display and he was actually part of the um, skit that they put on, which was um, a bit of a surprise for us as well. Um, uh, uh, going on with the congratulations, con congratulations to ABIC. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Congratulations to ABIC, Mr. Speaker, who has been working with the Department of, Edu Department of Education to develop um, an international business curriculum with our middle schools. Um, we had all of the middle schools out this, uh, this week visiting various companies around Bermuda. I, happened, I, stopped, stepped, I um, dropped in on the this, um, well, Delwood primary when they were at Chubb on Monday. And last evening, Mr. Speaker, um, along with uh, Mr. Cole, I want to congratulate Julia Snelling and the efforts that she has done. I remember Juliana Snelling and associate um, Minister Wilson as well with that. Uh, Juliana is passionate about what she does. Um, and what we can say is that when I sat down with her and we talked about Plan 2022, which also incorporates reaching out to the corporate sector to get them to donate to public schools, she has taken that on with a passion. And everything that she does ties directly back into Plan 2022 which should serve, serve notice to the public how, how wonderful that actual plan is and how it reaches all of our community. Um, she is not a registered charity. It's different the way they operate. Um, they, they literally collect no money. They just get people to donate supplies, which um, goes to the schools. And they reach out to the schools and ask the schools what it, is it that they actually need so they're not bringing anything that will not be utilized. So uh, congratulations to them. They had deliveries this week to all of the primary schools, all 18 of them, over the course of three days, where they delivered, um, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Cole said, um, se almost, almost $70,000 worth of supplies this week alone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the, the chair recognized the Honorable Ben Smith. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I would like congratulations to be sent to the Bermuda Girl Guides. Um, last Sunday, I was able to attend their thinking day, which actually was their celebration of 100 years in Bermuda. Um, participating in that, it was, it was important to see how many young girls and women are participating in that program and the, the important, uh, associate, the, the important uh, leadership qualities that are being shown to our young uh, women in the country by this program and uh, I'd like to to make sure that the leaders of the the rainbows brownies girl guides and the uh, rangers are all part of that um, congratulations thank you thank you honorable member does any other member wish to speak you recognize the honorable member from constituency 20, 30, 32. Thank you and good morning, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to Carl. Good morning, Member. Mr. Speaker, I rise today just to recognize 
Uh, this week I had the opportunity of attending the Southampton Preschool uh, following an invitation from the administrator, Mrs. Karen Jones. And Mr. Speaker, I ask that we send them uh, our, our absolute congratulations on their Bermuda Black History Week. It was an excellent time uh, that was had by all that were present. Mr. Speaker, the um, teacher, Mrs. Um, I believe it's Mrs. Durant, Mrs. Katisha Durant. Um, we had a great time. Black History Week is an important time uh, in our history, and to see our young people, to see our preschool students expressing such energy and excitement. They presented, they're preschool students, but they expressed so many good questions to me as it related to the job that I do, what I'm doing in, 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 in the community, uh, and also as a a parliamentarian and they were excited and the teachers and all of us had a great time. I had also an opportunity while I was there to visit the classroom. So Mr. Speaker, I rise on this occasion to uh, wish them all the greatest of congratulations and to wish them well uh, as they begin this, this, this tradition of annually uh, recognizing um, this particular time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. I recognize Honorable Member Minister Simmons. You have the floor. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. <clears throat> I rise to my feet today to give congratulations for Dalton E. Tucker Primary's P6 class for the completion of their Random Acts of Kindness initiative. Mr. Speaker, early in February, myself and Ms. Daniels from um, Constituency 33 were given the opportunity to judge the list of random acts of kindness that the class wanted to participate in in the community. And from the list that the children produced, they identified the following things that they would do. And they went out on the 28th, the last day of February, and did community work at the Port Royal Golf Facility, the Dr. Ken Residential Park, Telford Rest Home, and at the Port Royal Fire Station. I think that the commitment of the teachers and the parents and all who were involved in this initiative in getting our children to understand giving back to the community and the enthusiasm that was displayed by the children who participated was unparalleled. And I think commend, commend, commendment to everyone involved. Mr. Speaker, um, I would also like to extend congratulations to the Bermuda Economic Development Corporation, which last week hosted an event celebrating all who helped to make the year 2018 into 2019, actually 2019, um, 2018, successful. Mr. Speaker, the work being done at the Bermuda Economic Development Corporation is outstanding. The team in place there have been doing a phenomenal job to move the dial in terms of expanding entrepreneurship and making the path to business ownership, access to capital, much easier. And their work should be commended. And finally, Mr. Speaker, on a sad note, I neglected, if, I, if it's been mentioned before, I would like to be associated with the remarks. But if not, I would like comment, um, condolences sent to the family of Mrs. Eleanor Lolly Simmons. Mm. She, um, a stalwart Hog Bay level, mm -hmm. she is a woman who lost the use of her arm in 1978 in a traffic accident. And, waged an epic case to actually get justice for herself. Despite her disability, um, she had also, before having the accident, was one of Bermuda's first black female traffic wardens and was a trailblazer in many ways. But I think that, that what I remember her for the last time I saw her was her little dog that you had to tell you didn't bite because he was a little nipper and her claiming possession of every PLP paraphernalia I could take off when she came by the house. Mm -hmm. If it was a wristband or a, lar a lanyard, anything. It wasn't leaving the house. So, Mr. Speaker, she is missed. She had a beautiful homegoing ceremony at Fort Scholar, which the outpouring of love from the community and the amount of people who came out, family, friends, neighbors alike, it truly showed the impact that she had that went beyond the public note and the things that she was noted for, but to the connections she made with everyone in the constituency and the community at large. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable mem Member. Does any other Honorable Member? We recognize Honorable Member from Constituency 19. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Yes. Speaker, I'd like to have congratulations sent to the Leopards Club, who over the weekend celebrated their 70th an anniversary. And I must admit, Mr. Speaker, it was very, it was very good to see mm. the installation of the new executive, because I was impressed by not only the what I call the the, the youth as well as the, um, the elder statesmen, but also the number of women as well. So, Mr. Speaker, they have a long history and they should be congratulated. Thank you. Any other member wish to speak? We recognize the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to, of course, be associated with the condolence message um, to the family of Mr. Alex Swan. Um, I would also like to ensure that the record notes the congratulatory message for the group Hindsight that last week had a musical review at the Spinning Wheel nightclub bringing much um, wanted uh, activity to the north of Hamilton mm -hmm. and our efforts to uh, bring new life and rejuvenation through parts of the city. Um, they not only featured themselves, but also featured a number of local artists in their own effort to advance and uh, increase the opportunities for local musicians. Uh, this is a very passionate cause that the Heinz Brothers and their musical group um, are working on. I believe this review was a tribute to Stevie Wonder, and their next one is likely to be a tribute to Motown. So all persons are encouraged to follow and attend their next event. They are one of Bermuda's top musical bands that travel the world, but their desire is to see the lot of musicians and music in Bermuda to move forward and to improve um, back to some of the, uh, in sort of tribute to some of the days in the past when we had much more things happening for musicians. So congratulations to them and their efforts to advance musicians and the cause of music in Bermuda. Thank you, Deputy. Does any other member be recognized as Honorable Member from Constituency 4? Honorable Member Ferbert, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, congratulate the Bermuda Special Olympics team who will be on their way to the UE um, March 14th to the 22nd, where they'll be re representing Bermuda in various um, sporting events such as track and field, tennis, bocce, bowling, and equestrian. And I'll just like to call out their names. Christopher Trott, Kirk Kamari Dill, Delshay Landy, Damon Emery, Soleil Thomas, Danielle Gibbons, Janasha M Maloney, Bridget Marshall, Michael Lambert, Tiana Lowe, Wayne Smith, Cart Carlton Thomas, Thompson, sorry, and Eden Woolery. And um, for anyone who is interested, I think we should have the opportunity to take the time to view the opening ceremony, uh, which will be aired on the Sporting Channels at 8 a.m. our time on March the 14th. Associate the whole house with that. I'd like to associate the whole house with that, Mr. Speaker. And I would also like to thank this government, um, the many other sponsors, coaches, volunteers, and families who have assisted in making this opportunity possible. And hopefully when they return, we can congratulate them with any awards or medals that they have won. Yes. I'd just also like to be associated with the Black History Exhibit uh, with Paget Primary. Um, I believe the Minister of Education specifically spoke about the ASD classroom in which they did a phenomenal exhibit on our premier, uh, David Bart. Um, it was actually quite awesome. They did a fabulous tour, whoever went into the classroom and toured the classroom, and it, it really, really represented a awesome exhibit and museum style. So I want to say congratulations to the whole of Padgett Primary and the ASD program who did a phenomenal job in that aspect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Does any other member wish to speak? I recognize the Deputy Speaker. Deputy, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to be associated with the remarks on the esteemed Alex Scott, Alex Swan. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> Alex, um, Have you checked this morning? Yeah. Is that Lawrence? Yeah. No, Lawrence is okay. Um, Mr. Swan, every time I visited his house, um, we, yes. we sat down and we had a good rep. And I always left uh, that house with words of wisdom mm -hmm. and, and some things to, to do. So I know he would be sorely missed by his family, friends, and, and everyone that knew him. Also, Mr. Speaker, um, I'd like to send condolences to the family of Mr. Henry Birdie Smith, who was eulogized last week in Hamilton Parish. He also will be sorely missed by his family. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to be associated with your remarks concerning the Honorable Ottawell Eskrew Simmons. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, everybody in this country has benefited from the work 
and the commitment of Artie Simmons. Everybody, every job, regardless of what you have. In fact, it was Mr. Artie Simmons under his leadership that the health and safety standards in the workplace, um, he, he achieved that for the workers. You know, once upon a time, you go up on a scaffolding on an outside building, just some two by fours and, and, and two by twelves, and that was it. No, no netting or anything. Today, you see it different when they go on, on high roofs. Also, I must say, Mr. Simmons is probably one of the most honest people I ever met. I recall one time sitting in his office, and so he received a call from a supplier from overseas, and he had, the, he had it on the blower, and the guy says, do you want me to uh, doctor the invoice uh, down so you pay less, less um, taxes? Mr. Simmons says, let me tell you, sir, I don't mind paying my taxes. Whatever it costs, that's what I want you to be shown on the invoice. So, Mr. Speaker, I've learned a lot from, from the Honorable Artie Simmons, and I'm so glad that he's still with us, and I hope he sees many, many more years in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. I recognize the Honorable Member from Constituency. Oh, okay. Well, I, I was going to call one of them, but they both sat down. Premier, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I would like to uh, rise this morning on a uh, very sad note, and I want to um, ask that this Honorable House uh, send a letter of condolences to the family of the late uh, Mr. Henry Jr. Smith, and I'll associate all members of this Honorable House with that. Uh, Mr. Henry Smith, the uh, husband of the late Gloria Smith and loving father to Sean Smith, who was married to Janelle Smith, and also uh, Seanette Pirot, who is married to uh, Terry uh, Pirot. I know Mr. Smith, I knew him my entire life, uh, Mr. Speaker, as uh, he was a member of the Breakfast Club, and my father was a member of the Breakfast Club, is a member of the Breakfast Club as well. Um, so I've known him throughout my uh, entire life. Um, he uh, was our family plumber. He was, an ex uh, he was a very experienced plumber um, and uh, worked um, at a number of, not only in that, in, not only in his profession, which he passed on to his family, um, to, with his uh, son and also his grandson. But in addition to that, he was a musician, and a well-known musician. Um, and so he was um, in uh, the Bermuda Regiment Band for a very long time. He was also a member of the Blues Beat Band, a member of the Ex-Artillery Men's Association, as I mentioned, the Breakfast Club, and also the Man Cave and Woman Cave crew. Um, he was in his uh, 80th year, um, and I wish uh, he will be um, uh, recognized in a homegoing service uh, tomorrow afternoon, but I wanted to make sure that we can at least extend condolences up here, Mr. Speaker, as he is another stalwart uh, who has gone on to glory. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to uh, associate uh, with remarks of which have already been given uh, today uh, for uh, Dr. Karika Weldon and the Bermuda Principles Foundation on the success of her th their third annual conference, which took place here. Uh, Dr. Weldon, as I see her, she came to visit me in the office yesterday. I think she might have actually been up here earlier. Just and I tell her, Mrs. Just Speaker, uh, that she inspires me. She inspires me to uh, continue to do the work of service because she does not hold any position and or rank, but the work of which she's done uh, for our young people, um, the vision of which she's had by watching a BBC documentary, finding out about Bermuda principles, and starting this foundation, exposing our young people uh, to uh, Nobel Prize winning scientists and some of the best scientists and geneticists in the world. Uh, find their way to Bermuda on an annual basis because of her vision. It is something that the government is proud to support, and I know that members of this Honorable House uh, supported her work and her effort, I think, uh, last week or the week before last, as she's mentored young uh, Miss Cameron Young uh, to go ahead and Miss Young Cameron Young. I should also extend congratulations to her as she actually presented mm -hmm. at Bermuda Principles as a result yes. of her research. It is excellent stuff, and this government wants to make sure that we continue to recognize her and uh, to hold her up. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I want to um, be associated with your remarks for the uh, congratulations which were given uh, to Padgett Primary on their, wonderful, on their annual Black History Month Museum. It was um, especially poignant for me. I was surprised that my mother was able to keep as many mementos as she did, uh, but I think that it was a, tritting tribute, a, a fitting tribute but I think what was also impressive, Mr. Speaker, is that it was the ASC program. And what shows is that we can be inclusive and all of our students can participate and can demonstrate uh, their uh, talents to the country. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Premier. 
Recognize the Honorable Member uh, Manus. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just rise to my feet to be associated with the condolences that were given to the family of Eleanor Simmons. Uh, and I just wanted to elucidate a little bit on that. I had a long association with uh, Ms. Simmons. She was a wonderful person. I represented her as her attorney for many, many years. And it was I who took her case to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council when she was injured in a, a traffic accident where the, where the person who hit her was uninsured. And uh, we took that case to the Privy Council. And that case uh, was one of the factors that led to the creation of the Motor Insurance Fund, which is the fund that we all contribute to that covers people who are injured by uh, uninsured drivers. Uh, and I must say, I represented her for many years, and she was a most marvelous person. Unfortunately, I was unable to get to the event uh, at the time of her passing, but I would just like to send my condolences to her family. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Now I recognize the Minister. Minister Keynes. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to associate, associate myself with the congratulations to the Lappets Club. I had the uh, privilege of being the keynote speaker for the event, and it, it, it was indeed a privilege to be, to be chosen. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to uh, give my congratulations to Bermuda's under-16 netball team. And although they are due to head quite soon uh, to, take part in a, to take part in a tournament, Mr. Mr. Speaker, these are young ladies who are, have been chosen from around our our, our high schools, and, and this is the best of the best that we have in Bermuda. They're due to go to uh, play in uh, the Caribbean later this week, and we are wishing them well. But most of all, we are really excited for the accomplishment. One of their proud mothers is here in the uh, gallery this afternoon, and we'd like to acknowledge her as well. Mr. Speaker, also on a sad note, I would like to uh, offer condolences to the family of Ms. Hilda Place. Mr. Speaker, Ms. Hilda Place uh, was uh, 97 Year, year, years old. She was the daughter of M Mr. Uh, A.B. Place, uh, of, 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 of the recorder, a longtime resident of Shelton Road, and a member of the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church, and a stalwart member of our community. I'd like to offer my condolences to our family. Thank you, Minister. Is there any other member? We recognize the honorable member from Constituency 36. Mm -hmm. I'm a member. You have the floor. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Mr. S Mr. Speaker. May I ask that congratulations be uh, sent to, firstly, to the organizers of Keeping uh, Bermuda's Culture Alive. Uh, this was an event, again, held uh, at uh, one of our institutions that has been mentioned a number of times this morning, the Leopards Club. Um, the speakers who were celebrating uh, our cultural literary giants included our own minister, the Honorable Walton Brown, uh, Dr. Ray Dell Tankert, and young uh, uh, teacher, Mr. Colwyn, Junior Birchall. He told me not to call him Colwyn. Seems like he's, he wants to be known as Junior. To be associated is uh, my honorable friend, Mr. Michael Weeks, the Honorable Michael Weeks. Sir, uh, I'd also like congratulations of this house to be sent to the most recent inductees to the uh, honorary fellows uh, of the Bermuda College. This year they were, and uh, the honorable member and minister of health, uh, Ms. Kim Wilson would like to be associated with these congratulations to Mr. Andrew Banks, Dr. Wilbur Warner, and Mr. Peter Durhager. Mr. Speaker, very quickly on a sad note, uh, in the Somerset and Somerset North area, we lost whoops, Mr. Whoops, Calvin. Whoops. We lost Mr. Calvin uh, Lynch over the, uh, the period, and uh, Minister Wilson and I would like to be. I'd like to associate the whole house. Yes. A, a, a very dynamic, decent uh, Bermuda citizen had his uh, cut his path in broadcasting uh, behind the camera. Calvin Lynch, uh, we ask that his condolences be sent to his entire family. Mr. Speaker, I also would like condolences to be sent to the family of uh, another constituent, the family of Mr. Adrian uh, Hassel, a young man who lost his life tragically in a tragic accident over. Uh, the, the last month or so. Young Adrian was a dynamic student at the Barclay, uh, and his principal, Ms. Uh, Gabisi, was there uh, uh, in great lamentation over his, Mrs. Simmons was there, uh, uh, lamenting the, 
the, the passing of this young man because she recalled what a great leader he was and what a great figure and presence he was at the Barclay Institute. So to his family, on the sadness of this occasion, we offer the House's uh, condolences. Thank you. Recognize the Honourable Member Dunkley, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to be associated with the congratulations sent to Dr. Karika Weldon, um, but also add that um, one of my colleagues, the Honorable Cole Simons, pointed out that she has just been nominated and accepted an invitation to join the Royal Society of Biology in the UK, which has over 18,000 members. So it's clear that Bermudians continue to do great things around the world. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, um, I'd like this Honorable House to send congratulations and thank you to Pat Philip Fairn, who I believe is moving on from the BTA at the end of April. Pat has done a tremendous job and should be thanked. Uh, to Lamont Marshall, a constituent of mine who broke the Bermuda record again in the 5,000 meters just recently in a race overseas. And to Firefighter Haynes on being nominated and receiving the Firefighter of the Year named after a wonderful firefighter, Arthur Glassford. I'd like to be associated with the condolences sent to um, constituents of mine and close uh, constituents of mine, uh, Henry Smith and the Benjamin uh, family on their passing, and also uh, sent condolences to uh, Mr. Frank Flood's family and his passing in early December, to the Piva family for the most tragic passing of their daughter by way of suicide, to the Miners family in the passing of Norman Miners, who I love to talk about everything, especially golf. And uh, recently, and my colleague, the Honorable Gene Atherton, would like to be associated with that, uh, recently um, passing of Cecil Layton, who used to work up in Somerset and was a manager of, I believe, uh, one of the marketplace stores. Cecil knew everyone in Bermuda, and he died after a short illness. And finally, um, to the family of uh, Shishin Badenduk, who passed recently, and I think the, um, the honorable member from constituency uh, three would like to be associated, and as well as honorable members in this house. Um, she was a young lady who inspired uh, people with her perseverance and her can-do attitude, and always had a smile on her face, and she'll be missed uh, by family and friends and all her, all her family at the age group of companies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, honorable member. We now recognize the honorable member from St. George's. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, listening audience. Ming, you have the floor. First of all, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to be associated with the comments for Mr. Alex Swan, and I'd also like to extend um, thoughts and prayers to the family of Mr. David Parsons, formerly of Bermuda, now in Canada. Um, his daughter, um, Fiona, works with me, and I know that it's been a difficult time for us. I'm just letting them know that they're in our thoughts and prayers. And on a more um, happier note, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to congratulate the St. George's Parish Council they are um, one of our staples within our St. George's community. And this last past week, they hosted their um, annual public meeting, which they're required to do. But they always do it with finesse. They always make sure that they have something that's interesting to the public, so that when the public comes out, they are um, engaged. And they, this year, they um, actually had the information commissioner. And I was shocked to see that so many people wanted to actually come out to hear what the information commissioner had to say because sometimes when you speak about certain things, people are like, eh, I don't want to go. But this time they had a crowd of, um, I think I counted just about 20 people, and there were lots of relevant questions that were being asked um, about the inf information commissioner and what her office does. So I commend them for continuing to look for ways to engage and interact with the public, and also for their chairperson, Ms. Rosalind O'Brien, who has served on the council for many years, and she continues to invest so much of herself into the St. George's community and so much into the St. George's Parish Council. So on that note, um, Mr. Speaker, and just a big shout out to Mr. Stanley Morton, because I know he's out there listening today, and just want to let him know that we're uh, thinking about him as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Is any other member? Recognize the minister, Minister Birch. Mr. Speaker, um, good afternoon now. Yes, um, I'd like to be associated with the condolences to the families of Alex Swan and Henry Smith. Um, I, of course, found Henry Smith in the Bermuda Regiment when I joined mm -hmm. um, and left him there when I, um, <laughs> when they, when I retired. No, um, Mr. Speaker, I'd also like for condolences to be sent to the to constituent of mine, the family of Catherine of Virginia Marilyn Fisher. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, um, Anybody who ran on Cedar Hill 
with Nerdy Fisher family, yes. and certainly Mrs. Fisher, who loved to cook and, and, and provide goodies. Mm -hmm. And so she didn't have to worry about me coming to canvas, because <laughs> whenever I smelled bacon, whether it was her turn or not, <laughs> I would swing by. Mm -hmm. And so I'd ask that condolences be sent to her, her husband, Mr. Freeland Fisher, and, and her four daughters. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thank you. Does any other member wish to speak? No other member, that brings us to a close of the condolences and congratulations this morning. And we'll move on to the next item. Matters of privilege. There are none. Personal explanation. There are none. Notice for the motion for the adjournment of House on Matters there are of Urgent Public Importance. Introduction of bills. Yes, we have five bills that are going to be introduced this morning. The first is in the, actually all of them, in the name of the minister of finance, except for that last one. Minister of Finance, would you like to move yours and then the... Yeah, you can move your... You can move, put your bills in. Yes. Mr. Speaker. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hold on. Okay. Go ahead, Minister of Finance. I'm introducing the following bill, which according to Section 36.3 of the Bermuda Constitution requires the Governor's recommendation so that it may, may be placed on the order paper for the next day of meeting. Land Tax Amendment Act 2019. Mr. Speaker, I'm introducing the following bill, which according to Section 36.3 of the Bermuda Constitution requires the Governor's recommendation so that it may be placed on the order paper for the next day of meeting. Financial Services Tax Amendment Act 2019. Mr. Speaker, can I just give all the five, six names sequentially, or do I need to introduce them individually? You have to name them individually, but I'll let you do them all together. How's that? Rather than Perfect. get up and die. In the spirit of efficiency, which yes. the government is promoting positively. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm introducing the following bill, which according to Section 36.3 of the Bermuda Constitution requires the governor's recommendation so that it may be placed on the order paper for the next day of meeting. In this case, the Foreign Currency Purchase Tax Amendment 2019, the Hotels Temporary Customs Duty Relief Amendment Act 2019, and the Restaurants Temporary Customs Duty Relief Amendment Act 2019. Thank you, Minister. I think the next bill is in the name of the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am introducing the following bill for its first reading so that it may be placed on the order paper for the next day of meeting, Municipalities Reform Act 2019. Thank you, Deputy. Opposition bills? There are none. Private members' bills? There are none. Notice of motions? There are none. Orders of the day? Members, as you know, the main item today is number one on the order paper, which is the resumption or the reply to the budget debate. And as the clock is so close to that magical time of 1230, I'm going to suggest that we rise now, have lunch, and be back at 2 o'clock and we can start with the reply from the opposition to this year's budget. Any objections to that? Okay, we will now stand adjourned until 2 p.m.